In this segment, we're going to talk about boundary and initial conditions, which we'll need in order to solve our thermal diffusion equation, our energy balance. Here's our general heat conduction equation with a constant K. It's in kind of an ugly form right now, but if we want the temperature profile as a function of position within the medium, we need to integrate it. Recall that we derived this by looking at the differential control volume within the medium of interest, and it's valid regardless of the thermal conditions on the surface. However, you know intuitively that the thermal surface conditions, whether that be a prescribed surface temperature or convective heat transfer to or from the surface, will affect the temperature profile within the medium. So in order to integrate the general heat conduction equation, we need to have some boundary equations to describe the conditions on the surface. Furthermore, if the temperature is dependent on time, we're going to need to know the initial condition on, or the temperature within the medium as a function of position at the beginning of the process. Table 2.2 in your book lists some common boundary conditions. Let's look at the first one. This one is where you have a constant temperature at the surface. Where might you see this in practice? Let's say that you have a hot wall shown in red on the right, and contact with a colder fluid, which is in blue on the left. The water begins to boil. You are interested in the temperature distribution within that wall. Well, if the pressure is constant, that boiling, that phase change, occurs at a constant temperature. That's something you will remember from thermodynamics. Therefore, the temperature right at the surface where the phase change is occurring is at a constant temperature as well. Let's look at the next boundary condition in which you have a heat flux at the surface. The place where you would see this is with a seed starting mat. These are mats that provide a heat flux to seedlings to encourage germination. You could see this at the bottom middle. So in the picture here on table 2.2, the surface heat flux would be applied at the surface of the soil. We'll just ignore the very thin plastic tray between the soil. Well, seed starting mix, but we'll just call it soil. And the temperature distribution shown there is the temperature distribution in the soil. An interesting condition involves an adiabatic or an insulated surface. Now you may actually have a case where the K value is so low for the insulation against the surface that you choose to assume that there's no heat flux throughout the surface. However, we often use this boundary condition to take advantage of thermal symmetry. Let's take the case of thermal symmetry in a plane wall. And when we say plane wall, we're indicating that the heat transfer is one dimensional within that plane wall. In other words, the temperature gradient, the temperature change is only significant in one direction. Let's also say that we have the same, uh, com the, the same boundary condition on either side, maybe a convective heat transfer of the same magnitude on both sides that's cooling the wall. But let's also say that you have a volumetric heat generation within the wall. That means that in the middle, the temperature will be at the highest and on the surface, it'll be the lowest due to that convective heat transfer loss. And the temperature distribution will look like the pink line drawn on the picture of the plain wall. At the very top of that temperature distribution, the slope is zero. And so the heat transfer rate at the very middle, which is conduction and governed by Fourier's law, is zero. We can also take advantage of thermal symmetry in cylindrical coordinates. If we have a solid cylinder exposed to convection, whereby heat is removed from the cylinder, and it's fairly long so that the temperature gradient in the axial direction is negligible to that in the radial direction, and perhaps there's a volumetric heat generation com uh, component. Um, you can imagine that the temperature at R equals zero will be the highest temperature. The temperature at the outer radius will be the lowest temperature. That's, there's a temperature gradient along the radial direction, but it's the same temperature gradient as we go around the circumference. And if we look at the heat conduction right at the center, it would be zero for the same reasons as the plane wall. And then finally, we have a convective boundary condition at the surface. Um, and for that, we need to use Newton's law of cooling to describe the heat flux at the surface. Now, I know everybody has already taken differential equations, but let's do a quick review of how many boundary conditions that you'll need in order to solve the heat conduction equation. 
Well, it depends on how much you can simplify that heat conduction equation. Let's say that you have 1D one-dimensional steady state heat conduction and perhaps you have some source of volumetric heat conduction uh, of heat generation. You're going to need two boundary condition or two boundary conditions because in order to describe the heat pro heat transfer problem completely, you need two boundary conditions for each direction, um, each direction of the coordinate system along which the heat transfer is significant. So if you have 2D, uh, <clears throat> two-dimensional, 2D, two-dimensional steady state heat conduction, this time say with no heat generation, you're gonna need four boundary conditions, uh, two for each direction in which you have significant a significant temperature gradient and thus a significant heat transfer. Um, what if the temperature distribution has a time component? So you have a non-steady state one-dimensional heat conduction. You'll need two boundary conditions, but you will also need an initial condition that tells you what the profile is at the beginning of the process at t equals zero. It could be that the medium was at a uniform temperature or it could be that the medium was not at a uniform temperature, uh, but the temperature profile at T time equals zero is known. Um, so for the remainder of for the remainder of the chapter, we'll work some more simple problems. But as we move on to chapters three and four, we'll be formulating some more complex analytical solutions. Um, to the temperature distribution within systems with specific boundary conditions. So um, we'll work the next time, we'll work some problems the next time we meet. So uh, thank you for watching. Let me know if you have any questions.